Great. Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Thursday, April 7th at 9.15 a.m. And we are going to start with S-224, an act relating to juvenile proceedings. And uh, we'll be brief this morning. I, um, I'm going to go over the uh, the new, the latest draft, 1.1, 1 .1, uh, um, which incorporates very minor changes, but some you know, changes that we do have, and we have legislative counselor Patrick to help us do that. Um, I also do want to let folks know that um, the very um, at the very end of the bill, there is a uh, report in Section 18, and. Uh, House um, Institutions and Corrections Committee is working on that that section because that really is within their jurisdiction, and I know Eric has been working with them, and and they will get back to us. So, um, so we're not we're not ready to to vote on this bill um, because we certainly do want to wait to hear from uh, from corrections. So, with that, good morning, Eric. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Um, nice to see everybody. This is. Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to uh, walk the committee through the uh, proposed committee amendment to S-224. Uh, that's uh, an act relating to juvenile proceedings. <clears throat> Remember, there's been some discussion about a few different issues that were uh, requiring some further work. So there is some updated language uh, in this new proposed amendment. I've highlighted where the changes are so that we can skip right to those. I assume that would be the best the best way to go through it. Just look at the changes. Is that right? Sure. Yep. Great. All right. So if everyone does have the the committee amendment, uh, which is draft 1.1 dated uh, April 6th, you'll see the first series of changes are, are at least on my version, page nine, uh, and it's in section 10. And this has to do with uh, remember, there's a, a number of different provisions related to uh, the rights of victims in delinquency and youthful offender proceedings. So if you skip down to Section 10, you'll see, and this is uh, the first issue has to do with, um, you recall the discussion around uh, the presence of the victim during uh, the proceedings and what the victim's uh, rights are during uh, during their presence at the proceeding. And specifically, the discussion was around, you'll see that, uh, and this language appeared both, it's in existing law with respect to youthful offender proceedings, and the proposal was to sort of true those up with, with um, the rights of victims and listed crime proceedings. And you'll see uh, at the very bottom of page nine there, uh, there is no change to this first part, but the, so the victim has a right to be present during all court proceedings subject to rule 16 of the rules of evidence, which you recall is the authority of the judge to uh, exclude witnesses until after previous witnesses have testified. Uh, so that's so they're not influenced by the testimony of previous witnesses is the concept there. So that part remains. But the issue was uh, this struck through language that you see there at the bottom of page nine to express reasonably the victim's views concerning the offense and the youth. And so the, the issue that had come up was, uh, you know, the way this is phrased, or the way the way it had been phrased, I should say, uh, it appeared to permit the expressed expression of views by the victim at any time during the proceedings. And the question had been, well, is that the, is that the right approach or is it um, uh, better to have the expression of the victim's views occur for, at the disposition of the proceeding in the same way that the expression of the victim's views occurs at sentencing during adult proceeding? So uh, with that in mind, the stakeholders group uh, after so there was some testimony on that from Judge Davenport, the stakeholders group uh, went off and worked on some language to try and respond to that concern. And you'll see the way that it does that is it strikes the language from the first part of that phrase. And instead, so if you read it, it's going to uh, fold in with uh, uh, the victim's presentation of their views at disposition. So if you read the full sentence, it would then go on to say uh, what I just said about Rule 16, and then, and then uh, to attend the disposition hearing to present a victim impact statement and to express reasonably the victim's views concerning the offense and the youth. So in other words, it's been moved so that it's encompassed within what the victim does at disposition, as opposed to being um, uh, permissible at any phase of the proceedings. 
So that's the way that issue is addressed to to put that part of it, the expression of views at this position. But then similarly, at the end of the sentence, remember the sort of related issue was, well, <clears throat> maybe that there would be with the you know, agreement of the court that there might be other times when it would be appropriate for uh, the victim to uh, uh, present some oral or written statements about their views at, at not necessarily at this position, but at another time during the proceeding. So that is addressed with that final clause which uh, is an addition, which provides that they also have the right to submit written or oral statements to the court at such other times as the court may allow. So if it is a situation where at a stage of the proceedings, other than disposition, uh, uh, the victim may wish to present a statement and the court <clears throat> is in agreement that it would be appropriate, this provides the court uh, with that discretion uh, and that, can, that statement could be made at that time. So that's the way that issue is addressed. And you'll see that um, this is with respect to statements at uh, enlisted crimes, with respect to listed crimes, the same language or, or very similar language is also added. We'll get to it further on uh, for youthful offender proceedings. So again, the idea is to kind of keep, keep the rights consistent during uh, the proceedings. So you'll see it uh, as we go through uh, the amendment, the revised draft. Thank you, Eric. see it again, I should say. Thank you. Excuse me, so Eric, in terms of um, process, so this is language that um, that the stakeholders um, looked at and gave you feedback, and, and we certainly can hear from them, but just if you could just um, elaborate on the, on the process over the past few days. Yes, that's exactly right, that uh, after the uh, previous committee hearing on this and the testimony uh, about uh, how it was to to best situate the uh, the rights of the victim to express their views within the context of these hearings. The stakeholders went back. They met. I think they met. I think it was uh, Tuesday morning, I believe. And then during the course of that few days, actually starting last Friday, there were emails between myself and them, and they worked on this particular piece of the language. And I believe, again, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but I believe there is consensus around around this language from them. Um, and that, uh, uh, so this is their sort of consensus proposal to address the concerns that were uh, expressed last time the committee discussed it. Great, great. Thank you so much. Sure. So I can pause there in case anybody wants to comment or I can uh, move through to the next piece, whichever makes the most sense. Yeah, why don't we why don't we keep going and and then I'll see if any of the, the stakeholders that are here want to want to uh, comment on on these changes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So again, just down on or staying on page ten here, you'll see there's a couple other first change there on line twelve is really a, just a correcting a technical error that the reference to victim should have been a reference to the child because this is about victim notification when um, when the delinquent child. Uh, is released from a facility and you see it inadvertently said the victim gets notified when the victim is released that's obviously wrong so that's just a technical correcting of that error and then some clarification of the language about when this notification kicks in discharge isn't really the right term released into the community is you'll see that that uh, phrasing um, will also appear in the youthful offender statute that same same change and again that's another issue that had been being discussed and which the stakeholders were working on, which is, um, you know, when this release uh, from uh, uh, custody is appropriate and what the right language is for that. You know, particularly there had been some inconsistencies between the uh, listed crime, youthful offender, and non-listed crime provisions as to when release would uh, apply, when it would kick in. So. The stakeholders worked on that language as well to try and uh, make that uh, the different uh, types of proceedings consistent in that regard. Uh, it's a little bit different in the non-listed crime context, and that you'll see when we get to that. Uh, see, you, you see here, uh, the right applies uh, whenever uh, the um, child is released into the community from a secure or staff secured residential facility, and that's going to be the same, I believe, for youthful offenders. It's a little bit different for non-listed crimes 
because there's presumably there are going to be such situ- you know different situations because those offenses are presumably less serious than they would be with listed crimes and youthful offender provisions. So you'll see when you get to that, it's slightly different. But the uh, youth the YO and the uh, listed crime provisions are are meant to be the same, I believe. Again, that's a reflection of the consensus recommendation from the stakeholders group. So moving on. Uh, 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 yes. The word says if agreed to by the parties. Yes, that's moved. That's the non-listed crime situation. So. Uh, okay, but not the, for listed crimes. That will correct, be different. Or, or for youthful offenders. They, they have the right to get the notification. Um, uh, it's a blanket right, you know, uh, in the yeah. listed crime or YO. But in, if it's non-listed, when it's presumably less serious, there has to be this agreement by the parties. And can you just state who the parties are so I can be? Uh, well, it would be the state who would be uh, uh, prosecuting the offense, the the, the right. child and the, and the child's attorney. And and most likely it's going to be the guard, but the not the child. Is is the child able to? The child and the attorney, not the parent or guardian. Uh, I'm not. Sure. That's a good question. That's a very good question. I'm not sure technically who the party is in that situation. Uh, okay. So I'm going to defer to the experts on that one. Yeah, actually, um, Judge Davenport. I, I see your hand up. Well, good yeah. morning. Yes. Good morning. Oh, we can't hear you. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> there you go. Oh, no, 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 we're still muted. All right. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the parents uh, of a juvenile in a delinquency proceeding um, would not be a party. Um, They could be the guardian ad litem for the youth, uh, one of them or both of them sometimes. (laughs) Um, uh, They might become a party if at disposition, um, the issue has to do with who should have custody of the child post disposition, whether the the child uh, or youth should, you know, continue to have, whether the parents should continue to have custody and the youth is under conditions, some conditions of probation, which is very often the case in the low level, the low level offenses. Um, But in the more serious offenses, um, the state uh, may be proposing that the youth be in DCF custody, especially if it's, if they, if they were asking for a secure uh, or residential placement of any kind um, and or even a foster care placement. And in that case, when that happens, then the the parents do have um, do have party status at disposition. Um, They the the parent may be not in agreement uh, with that and may feel that the, the youth would be better off living at home and the the court's got to sort that one out. So in that instance, they would become a party, but other than when, it, when custody is at issue, but other than that, um, they're not a party in, in, in these proceedings. And the child, I'm not sure they're always a child, but the child will always have um, their voice. Yeah, they will always have an attorney and they will always have a guardian ad litem in, in most cases, the guardian ad litem would be a parent, uh, but if there are issues between the parent and the guard and the and the child, which would make the parent being a guardian ad litem not appropriate, the court would appoint a, a, an independent guardian ad litem. So I'm and sorry, you're right. Guess- we shift the language between youth, child, and juvenile in this. Uh, um, someday we need to clean that up, but yes. Um, but is the child always considered a party? Like I realize always. the attorney represents the child, but if the child- <clears throat> The child is always- the, Our attorney. Right. The child is always a party, always, always. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, great. Hey, Eric, thank you. 
Yes. So, yeah, that uh, uh, Representative Richardson's point uh, was actually a good segue into the uh, that provision, which is actually in Section 11. So as, as was kind of being touched on in that discussion, if you look at the bottom of page 12, this has to do with the rights uh, to notification during a non-listed crime. So that's the one difference between uh, the non-listed crime situation and the uh, listed crime slash youthful offender situation is right there. The highlighted language sort of at the end of line 19, the beginning of line 20, if agreed to by the party. So in this case, the notification to the victim uh, is uh, subject to agreement of the parties. Otherwise, the language is the same. It's before the child is released into the community from a secure or stat secured residential facility. That's the same. But if it's one of these less serious offenses, uh, again, not a big 12 um, uh, sort of offense, then whether the notification happens is going to be uh, contingent upon agreement of the parties. So that's the difference. And Eric, um, Barbara, I'll get to admit. So this is the language that I believe you worked on with Jennifer Pullman. I, I think from the from yes, and I think the yeah. stakeholders were were working on this as well. That okay. uh, uh, I, I th again, I think there was consensus on this piece as well. Okay, great. And Barbara has a has a question. Yeah. So, what if all the parties don't agree? I think the way it's written, if the parties don't agree, then the notification doesn't happen. So. One party is uncomfortable and says no, it doesn't happen. Correct. Okay. Yep. Whereas in the other, if for listed crimes and youthful offender situations, that agreement is not required, and it happens as of right whenever whenever the uh, child is released from the facility. That's the distinction. The way I read it. Actually, I see Jessica, uh, do, do you want to comment? I, yeah, I thought maybe I could just be a little helpful here. Uh, Jessica okay. Barquist for the Vermont Network. So the reason this is different here for non-listed <clears throat> crimes is that if a juvenile is going into a staff secure placement um, as a result of these proceedings on a non-listed crime, it's very unlikely that that is actually as a result of the crime or the relationship right. with the victim, right. but it's more about the um, the youth and their mental health or behavioral needs. Um, and so it's less likely that the victim is going to need that notification in the listed crimes. And it's more about the juvenile here. Great. Because my inclination, I, I'm glad to hear that. And uh, Jen, did you want to add anything? Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Jennifer Pullman for the record, Center for Crime Victim Services. Um, no, I, I believe that Ms. Barquist captured it perfectly. This was a consensus language that was developed by uh, DCF and the Defender General and the courts and uh, state attorneys in the center and the network and realizing that it was really striking an important compromise between recognizing that young people, if they are in a facility, um, due to you know, as a, as a result of a non-listed crime, that again, it doesn't really reflect the concerns of what um, might be what have happened with that actual direct victim so this was a piece that we felt was important in terms of striking that balance thank you any questions or no? Sorry. so that actually makes me wonder about why the other parties are even on that list like is it's like like why does the state attorney weigh in on that as we understood it from our discussion with the stakeholders, there would be particular situations, and as we understand it, so many of these cases resolve in through uh, you know just an agreement that there might be a piece wherein there was more serious harm. For example, let's say it was pled down to a non-listed offense, but action did involve um, more serious actions. That maybe that would be part of the agreement. Um, again, hearing from. Attorney Paul and Attorney Mean, and that that might be part of the agreement that results, and that there might be an agreement that yes, in certain cases, in that particular case, notification would be appropriate. But it does provide for both parties to um, agree and understand that that is a part of of that moving forward. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you.
Okay. So that takes us to the next uh, page 14. Yeah, so this is this is just you'll see the exact same language that we've just been discussing. Now we're in the youthful offender uh, section. And again, this is uh, being treated the same way as the listed crime uh, proceedings are are being treated because they tend to involve these more serious offenses. So you'll see that the language regarding um, the victim's right to attend and present a statement that's in subdivision two on the top of page uh, 14 is exactly the same as what we were just looking at, um, the right to be present during rule 615, that's existing law. And then it goes on to say the same language you were just reviewing with respect to listed crimes to attend the hearing, present a, the impact statement, uh, sorry, to attend the disposition hearing. So again, so the, the uh, expression of views is done at disposition. That's that first phrase, as we just saw with listed crimes, uh, including testimony in support of their claim for restitution and to submit, and I'm on line six and seven, oral or written statements to the court at such other times as the court may allow. That's that same concept of uh, that there may be other times when the victim's statements may be appropriate and that can be done with um, uh, permission of the court. Uh, and then, uh, and that last sentence is identical as well. So the next subdivision you see there, subdivision three, is the other issue that we were just discussing. Again, the same in youthful offender proceedings as it was for listed crimes, that notification happens as of right. You see there, there's no consent of the parties required. Happens as of right um, before the youth is released in the community from the secure or staff residential facility. So the language is trued up. Thank you. Can any members any questions? No. Okay. Great. Thank you. So that takes us quite a bit further down to section 15 over on page 21. This is just a, a technical correction. You'll see that the language had this was talking about um, the court providing a notice to uh, the offender in a youthful offender proceeding. This is the idea, remember, that they have to be informed that uh, by the court that they have to uh, complete a risk and need screening in order to qualify for youthful offender uh, treatment status. Um, and just that there had been a terminology mistake that youthful offender status was the right way to put that. You see, for example, just a couple of lines down in existing law, um, uh, line seven and eight refers to youthful offender status, for example. So rather than treatment, that's just a terminology correction. Moving on to section 16, which is page 22. This is the uh, psychosexual evaluation that can be ordered uh, uh, for certain offenses uh, for a youth as part of the disposition case plan. You'll see that the addition, the new language is highlighted. And I think the, the court talked about that. Um, uh, I think it was Judge Zone who might've mentioned it, that the court may order a psychosexual evaluation if clinically indicated for a child who's charged one of the, for one of the listed offenses. Okay. And lastly, the interest of justice here. And that's a new section, section 17 on page uh, uh, 23. Remember, this was something that um, uh, Judge Davenport and the uh, department both have brought up and uh, the language itself was um, proposed by the department, I believe. I did some editing and sent it back to the stakeholders. And I think that everybody, again, has there's consensus on the language now. And this is the concept. Remember that the uh, before a, uh, a child can be uh, housed in a facility that can, where there are adults, uh, for purposes of maintaining federal funding and being in compliance with federal law, this interest of justice hearing must be held. And so this proposes to add a section of law uh, to require this hearing before that can happen. So very similar uh, to the language that you took a look at. I think you might have seen it when the department proposed it. As I say, I did some uh, editing around with it, but for, it's very similar. Uh, you'll see so that it definitely um, has to be quick. It has to be no later than the next business day after a juvenile who's awaiting trial or other legal process uh, who is treated as an adult in the criminal division uh, after they've been within a business day after they've been taken into custody, the court has to hold this hearing. 
and determine whether to issue an order. And then there's the cross reference to the federal law that specifically requires that, specifically requires uh, that this hearing take place uh, whenever uh, there's a uh, an issue about a youth being housed with adults. So whenever that comes up, whenever there's a, the question presented to the court of whether that should be permitted, uh, the court has to hold this hearing before making the order. And, and what the court has to conclude, you see in line 10, is that it is in the interest of justice to hold the juvenile in a jail or other secure facility for adults. Uh, in this case, for Vermont language, owned or operated by DOC. And uh, also, if the order is issued, in other words, if they do issue the order to hold the youth in a facility with adults, they also have to determine whether to allow sight or sound contact with adult inmates as well. That's also specifically part of the uh, federal statute. Ken um, uh, and then Barbara. Eric and, and probably Judge uh, Davenport, but going back to the youth, what age was this again that we're talking about? Uh, I believe, I, it's a good question. I think that it could be uh, up to including someone who is being treated as a youthful offender. So it could be, I think that could be age through age 21, but I'm not sure if that 21 year old being treated as a youthful offender uh, would necessarily be subject to this required hearing. That's a good question or, or whether or not that only applies to, you know, 18 and under. So somebody 21 years old is not considered an adult. I'll wait for Judge Davenport. Yeah, right. see, I may be, I'm, I'm probably wrong on that. And, um, and, you're and excuse me, um, Ken, you're, you're asking specifically about this um, interest of justice hearing? Yeah, because I'm not, I'm not done with that. Um, I, I got another question to follow right up. With okay, that. all right, yeah. Um, yeah, Judge Davenport and, and then possibly uh, Tyler Allen. So this is this says specifically a juvenile, and uh, that that is uh, certainly um, up to up through seventeen years old, uh, and you know now we consider eighteen year olds. Some eighteen year olds come into our juvenile system, and the it's a little unclear. The feds don't really, since we're the only state that that includes eighteen year olds in our system. Um, we would, I think our interpretation would be that if this juvenile was a juvenile who would have otherwise gone through the juvenile system, um, that 18 year olds would be included, but it would not go further than 18 year olds at this point. Um, so uh, because this is specific to a juvenile who is being charged as an adult. Now, if you go back to a there's quite a complicated chart of your statutory provisions on when a uh, juvenile can be charged as an adult. Um, but think uh, the the Big Twelve, right? If you are four, if you are um, sixteen and seventeen year olds, you can be charged as an adult. You are charged as an adult if you are charged with a Big Twelve offense. Um, a uh, younger than that, it would have to be moved. No, younger than that, you could also um, be charged. I, there's a really great chart that shows when when juveniles can be charged as adults. Um, and I'm not looking at that right now. I still have to look at it because the provisions are complicated. Um, but also remember that there are, are offenses where um, youth who are charged in the family division as juveniles, those a case could be moved from, uh, for example, a felony could be moved, a uh, non-Big 12, but a felony, a serious offense, could be moved from family to adult. And in that case, um, they would also be considered uh, a, 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 under this provision if they were going to be placed in a uh, adult facility, which is Unlikely. I mean, we have, we have very few kids who fall into this particular provision, and Tyler Tyler can probably speak to that better than I can, in terms of actual numbers of kids who would we didn't <clears throat> contemplate putting into an adult facility uh, because we had nowhere else to put them. So just before Tyler start starts, just one thing that uh, because I'm kind of new to the, all this judicial stuff here, but 
when I just, the interest of the justice hearings, like I can't for the life of me understand why somebody under 18 years old would be thrown in an adult facility, right? Nor, and, and I'm gonna get off topic a little bit, but it happened here a year or two ago, um, that we had a social worker or, or whatever it is going into a hotel room with, uh, I think, a juvenile uh, sexual or something like that, putting them at risk with doing that. I mean, to me, that is just crazy, no common sense, no nothing. And, and I know I'm getting a little off topic here, but it's like, you got to be kidding me. This isn't already a law or guidance to follow. Tyler maybe can respond to it better than I can, but remember that one of our problems here <coughs> is the closing of Woodside um, as a secure detention facility, which is where we used to put uh, juveniles who are charged as adults, but who are a serious risk to the public. Um, so we don't have that juvenile detention facility anymore. We're trying to build a new one, but it's not there yet. Um, but Tyler can speak to it better than I can. Thank you. Tyler, good morning. Good morning. For the record, my name is Tyler Allen, um, Adolescent Services Director with Family Services Division of DCF. Um, hopefully I can provide a little clarity to a couple questions on the table. To the most recent question, um, I think the point is well taken. The fact that there, there has been challenging incidents regarding um, youths that are presenting kind of a, a, a dangerous profile that have been put into a community setting for lack of, of, of treatment option or of a placement option. Um, I think that's part of the reasoning behind this. I think if uh, the, the whole idea of an interest of justice hearing is for those exceptional circumstances where somebody has a crime where the public safety, you know, cannot be provided for um, within the juvenile system, that we have an avenue by which such juvenile could be housed securely. Um, but to do so, we would need a judge to, to kind of oversee that process and to ensure that the, the, the placement is appropriate um, to the needs of the youth, to the needs of the uh, community and public safety in general. That's the thinking behind interest of justice. And to the initial question regarding um, uh, the age the age of youths, uh, I'd, I'd agree largely with everything Judge Davenport pre presented. Um, our, the expectation of the JJRA, which is the federal language that drives this whole process, is that all youths that are under the age of full criminal responsibility um, is who this applies to. Um, and so the youthful offenders, the federal government has has guided us that they see that as a distinct population. Uh, the youthful offender population, I think they, they consider it extended jurisdiction and separate from age of full criminal responsibility. Um, but the, there is some abstraction in that federal term. And so they're leaving it up to states to set what the age of full criminal responsibility is. And so in some states, that might be as young as 16 years old. Um, in Vermont, in our reading of it and our understanding, and I believe this has kind of consensus uh, thinking but behind the stakeholders group that have all talked about this, um, and we've been operating under the, uh, the assumption that that goes up until the age of 19. Um, so everybody under the age of 19 are, are under the age of full criminal res uh, responsibility, so that would apply. Um, if raise the age continues, um, whenever that is, this bill proposes that's delayed a year, that would increase to include 19 year olds at such a time. But it wouldn't include the raise the age or the, um, the youthful offender population that can be extended above, if that makes sense. I also asked clarifying question about that if a youth ex you know, ages into that after so let's say we have an 18 year old youth who are considering a youth, you know, under the age of criminal responsibility that is being housed in a uh, uh, adult correctional setting. If they turn 19 while they're in that setting, then this no longer will apply to them because they've passed that um, that threshold. So I think the federal government want a concrete threshold. Originally, we were having conversations about it could vary depending on what side of the equation, you know, where they fall. 
So that's the that's the kind of general. It's a little bit complicated, and Vermont is more complicated than other places because of the Raise the Age initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Did you? So part of my question, I think, got answered, which is my understanding was that the feds want sight and sound separation. And what we were hearing from DOC um, was that they would have a one-on-one -on -one DOC worker at times with um, an offender in order to have the sight and sound separation, um, which, so one of the things I'm wondering is when would we ever find it appropriate to have someone not have sight and sound separation? And how can we make sure that the alternative doesn't end up being equally bad in a different way? <clears throat> Who would like to? <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead, please, Tyler. Yes. Thank you. I think I think that's an excellent question. Um, so part of what this and it's it's in the language that I think we're reviewing here. Um, during an interest of justice hearing, the judge can um, make an order, a written finding that it is in the interest of justice that a youth is held in an adult facility. And in that same hearing, the judge can also make a determination to waive sight and sound separation. So categorically, we do sight and sound separate this population from an adult population. But a judge can make the determination it is in the interest of this youth to actually not be sight and sound separated from the adult population. And that might speak a little bit to um, what uh, I believe Josh Rutherford provided some testimony with of concern um, from DOC, um, saying that they're forced to hold a youth in this scenario in isolation from the population, which which could be harmful and detrimental to their well-being. Uh, because holding somebody in isolation is not, you know, it's not an encouraged practice. And so this would allow for a judge to make that determination at that point. Is it appropriate to place in this setting? And if so, um, is it appropriate to sight and sound separate them or better to have them be integrated into the adult community? But, but why is in the interest of justice, it's like we're either going to um, torture you by putting you with adults who we know when adults are with younger people, the outcomes are going to be worse, or we're going to put you in solitary. So which of these two things are in the interest of justice? Like that, there's no justice there. There's no justice there for that young person having any hope of coming out better or for society. So I don't get why those are, you know, why those are on the menu. Um, Sorry, I was, yeah, no, I, I see Jenny. Whoever would like to respond to, to that, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, Jennifer Micah, General Counsel for DCF. I think that's a really important question. And you'll see in the bill that um, Eric walked you through that we do have a study, mm -hmm. um, a report that's supposed to come out. And actually, uh, Representative Emmons indicated yeah, that she wants it to be a plan oh, yeah. for what we're going to do with justice-involved youth. And we all agree that placing oh, youth Yeah, it's on the bottom when, when you repack the chair. Yeah. We, we all agree that uh, placing youth uh, either in what is essentially a solitary situation or placing them in um, with older uh, um, inmates is, is really not at all good for them. And so we are working towards creating systems that will support youth in, in age appropriate placements. And right now, obviously we, we don't have Woodside and we um, do not have a detention facility for the 18, 19 year old. So there is some struggle with that, that we are working on and we do intend to have a plan um, within the timeframes that will be required by this bill. Um, before, um, yes, Judge Avonport. Oh, good to see you guys. Yeah, I think these questions um, really point to the importance, quite aside from the fact that it's federally required, <laughs> of having these interest of justice hearings. Because I think that having a judge, uh, somebody who has not been involved in the planning or any part of the 
they can take a, a a look, a whole fresh look at why are you asking to put this child into a correctional facility? Why are you asking that there not be sight and sound separation? What are your options? Aren't there some other options? I mean, the 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 the, the hearing here could be protracted. It could take several hours to take the testimony. The judge would have to take the testimony and would have to make findings in order to place this child in a correctional facility, whether they're sight and sound. They've got to make findings that are in accordance with the criteria. And you'll see at the end of this, it says, at the end of the language here, it says, including the criteria set forth in the federal law. Well, the criteria makes you look at everything related to this child and at all the other alternatives, um, possible alternatives. So uh, it's like there are like seven seven different factors you have to look at. Uh, the judge has to look at and has to make written findings. Um, so you're talking about a lot of process here, but I think this process is really important um, because I think this is your your safety valve, you're, you're making sure that this is really the best decision that could possibly be made if that's what it is. And, and the court could very well find, no, it's not into the interest of justice, go back and find another alternative. Um, that's, that's also a possibility, a possible outcome at these hearings, but it, it does point to the importance of this language. It's just that important. It's our choice, right, policy-wise to decide. We have to have these hearings. But that's only if we keep on the menu the option of um, having an adult uh, prison be a placement for <clears throat> people under a certain age. And then if we want that, if we want sight and sound separation. But we could make a policy that says, unless extreme safety of the community and justice are at stake, this will only be used. Like, right, like we don't have to offer that, it's our choice. But if we offer it, we have to have a hearing. Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure of your question. You, you, the under hearing this language, you have to have a hearing, but <clears throat> If you if you wanted yes, I mean theoretically as a policy matter, you just similar to the statute that we already have in the ju in the in for juvenile cases that are in the family court, there is a statute that says no, you can't do this, <laughs> you 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 can never place uh, a juvenile in a um, in a in an adult facility, um, and there has to be sight and sound separation. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's a that that's a possibility. But here, you you are talking about a, a smaller subset of juveniles who are being charged as adults and are in the adult court, um, and that in and of itself means you're talking about kids who are being charged with pretty serious offenses. Thank you, uh, Ken and then Kate. Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Just for curiosity, how long has Woodside been shut down? It was officially closed in October of 2020. So, so about a year ago. Thank you. So when Woodside was closed down, was there a plan where we were going to house, house these youth for protection of them and also society? We put in place the contract with Sununu, and we had it. And I believe that uh, the secretary at the time uh, requested that DCF come up with a plan. And that's what our we are currently trying to get the Newbury facility in addition to using Sununu at this point. Trying to get the what facility? The yep. facility in Newbury. So in other words, in between there, everything kind of didn't work out right, and we've kind of got a situation on our hand that's not good for anybody. I think it's fair to say that um, we do not have all the facilities that we need for the 
for some of the youth that we that we take care of. Yeah. Fascinating. Thank you. And my understanding is that Sununu is not taking, has not been taking youth for, for a bit. That's what we heard. They, they stopped, you know, as with every facility, we had they had the same kind of staffing problems that everybody did. And so they did stop taking youth for, I believe, two or three months in um, the latter part of this year, uh, the latter part of last year and the early part of this year. But then they restarted um, in mid-January or late January, and we haven't had any trouble since then. Who, who closed Woodside? That was a decision by the Agency of Human Services. <clears throat> Thank you. Hey. Yeah, so um, I guess a couple of things. One, um, I had some questions about this section of the bill as well, and I, th I reached out to Marshall Paul, and I think where I sort of landed um, is along the lines of what I'm, I'm hearing now, which is that these pro like youth who are being charged as adults are being placed in adult prisons currently without this process in place. Um, and so, you know, I think... One of the concerns I had, because I was trying to understand the language, was it seemed like it was just setting it up to be compulsory for any youth who is being charged as an adult. And, I, and talking to Marshall, it helped me understand that the cross-reference to the federal statute clarifies that it's only youth who are being recommended for placement in an adult prison. So it's not, it's not like looking at adult prison placement for every youth that comes through the process. Um, and I think that, that helped me to feel better. I do just have a comment because it keeps being brought into the conversation. It's concerning to me, and no one's explicitly saying this, but I just, I would be really concerned if in the, if we walk away from this conversation feeling like, uh, like glorifying Woodside in any kind of way. I mean, the, the Woodside was a, was a horrible, placement. <laughs> and, and there is a tremendous amount of research and evidence that is coming out to, to reflect just how horrendous the conditions were at points in that space. And so I understand it's getting away from, it's been pulled into the conversation as I think as we're talking about how to support youth who are really at risk. I just want to be careful that we don't glorify a system that was really, really broken and doing a tremendous amount of harm to people in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Can I, I mean, just it is, it is, and it is relevant because the next section talks about a report, and institutions is is uh, working on this, and they want to plan. Mm -hmm. But we'll we'll see that. Um, yes. I just want to glorify a a uh, what was the word about Woodside? Glorifying? I'm not glorifying anything. I'm just saying we have no system in place that worked, and it's totally unacceptable to me. And it's like everything went to hell and we're not take care, taking care of the youth. We're not taking care of public safety. And me sitting here in a, as a lawmaker is unacceptable to me. And I want that just made perfectly clear. Like, like very seldom do I get upset in this room over things like that. I get upset over other things, but it's it's not something like this. This is like, we could have, should have done something a heck of a lot better than what we did. I'm not blaming anybody on screen or wherever, but somewhere we had a, a, a serious, a serious uh, meltdown in, in, in the system. And, and thank God that I met uh, Judge Davenport to understand the the things that uh, a judge goes through to try to make determinations of of what I guess lawmakers really do because it's we don't make your job easy. So I'm going to shut up now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, I just got a quick question. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, with the closing of I believe the only state operated facility in Vermont obviously, and, and I believe Sand Hill has been closed, uh, and, and I'm not sure if 206 Depot is still in use. Other than those present or non-present facilities, can any can anyone be lodged? Though I realize those are private facilities in like 206 Depot if they've been charged with a crime. No, they cannot. So, so we have no, we have no 
plan B, so to speak, then, when this all came about, other than Sununu? Sununu was the, was the, the fallback for us, recognizing that we have a very small number of youth who actually fall into this category. Were, were you able to uh, appropriate a number of beds there? Like, were you limited five, ten, whatever that may have been in some of them? I believe it's six. I th believe we have an opportunity to have six beds, which we've never filled. We've, I think we've used, I think we have had placed a, a total of six youth there in the time that we've had it as an option for us. And of those, I believe three of them were um, youth who came to Vermont as runaways from other states. Oh, last question. So Sununu is only a youthful offender. Placement facility, we couldn't place those 18 to 20 ones we're talking about at Sununu? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any any other questions? Any other questions? So um, it would be helpful for me if I could hear from the stakeholders as to um, whether or not these changes uh, reflect what you're looking for, and and that uh, that you agree to to the changes in in draft one point one. I recognize that there are things that were asked for that are not in here, or I don't want to talk about those, I want to just really look at the draft 1.1 and the changes. So why don't I start with um, Judge Davenport, please. Um, I am not a member of the juvenile stakeholders group, but uh, I'm I am very um, I'm happy with the changes, and I want to thank the committee and uh, thank Eric for um, bearing with me and um, and making the changes that were made. I think that they uh, I think that they work, and um, that the bill is a better is a better piece of legislation for that. So thank Great. you. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. So so your concerns in your um, in your letter from the council have been have been met. Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, I am. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tyler. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I am a member of the stakeholders group, uh, and so we, we did meet on Tuesday prior to this, but these revisions were made afterwards. Um, uh, Eric was able to send those revisions out to the whole stakeholders group, and we've shared them back and forth over the past um, few days. And so far, everybody who's weighed in has been in full support of these revisions. Um, I will acknowledge that I haven't seen uh, the Defender's General uh, Marshall's position um, on these. I, I imagine that he would be, you know, that these changes are aligned with the conversations we had in the stakeholders group. I would be surprised to see um, if there's any significant objection, but I won't speak for him. Uh, beyond that, everybody's either been in support or there was one provision that DOC uh, thought was um, out, you know, wasn't impacting them, so they were abstaining a, from a position. But I would say broadly, we 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 likely have consensus among that group with the changes that are in place in this draft. Uh, and I would welcome. I know Jennifer Pullman. I know Jessica and Jennifer Micah. Um, all are active with that group as well, so they they can feel free to chime in. Thank you. So, uh, Jessica. <laughs> Hi all, thank you. Jessica Barquist for the Vermont Network. Um, we have no concerns with this draft. And as um, Tyler said, we were part of that consensus in the stakeholders group. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate for the committee that the, the victims' rights sections of this bill are, are really incredibly important for us, um, that these are things that our member organizations and the juvenile victims that they work with have been asking for um, since the start of Raise the Age. And there have been a lot of um, concerns for victims in that process. So we're really, really pleased to see these um, in the bill and, and hope they stay as they are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Pullman, we've got we have two Jennifers here. <laughs> Jen. 
Thank you. Good morning again, Jennifer Pullman from the Center for Crime Victim Services. For the record, uh, we'll reiterate uh, much of what Jessica Barkwa said, which is that um, we entirely support the changes that are presented here today. We think it um, makes it a, a better bill that um, goes even further in terms of striking a balance between the different interests that are at play, and um, we do fully support them. I uh, also want to Second, what Jessica Barkwa said as far as, while there are a number of victims provisions in here, um, those pieces have um, kind of been overlooked as we've been doing a lot of reform efforts that support young people, which we are in favor of. And, and we just do feel that these provisions are really important in having, um, making sure that as we, as we make these reforms, as we change ages and increase the way that we can more be supportive of emerging youth that we also just think about what victims' um, voices you know, would look like in those cases. I do have one very technical change that's been bothering me since this bill was in the Senate, which is with, with respect to Section 8, when it speaks to the law enforcement um, responsibilities with respect to victims. And there are four places where the language refers to gender and not a young person or a juvenile. I do think that since this is a provision within Title 33, even though we did import it from Title 13, I think that, um, again, the center would request that perhaps the language um, be changed from offender to more appropriately. And as Judge Davenport uh, recognized, we don't know if it's a juvenile or a youth or a child, but something that is more, more comports with the uh, Title 33 and where this provision would land. Thank you very much. Right. I, I just want to make sure I understand what yes. phrase or word you want to use there. Um, well, I, I think that's again where just uh, Judge Davenport kind of uh, highlighted this uh, issue and whether it would be juvenile or youth. Um, but I think either one of those, but I don't think offender should be in a statute, statutory provision within Title 33. Our suggestion would either be juvenile or youth, but I would defer to Attorney Fitzpatrick to determine in light of a comprehensive look at uh, Title 33, what particular term would be the best. Anybody else? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you everybody so much. Um, and again, we're going to wait for institutions to uh, continue your work on, on the report, and then we'll look at this last uh, language and uh, keep you posted as to when we, can, when we can move the bill. So thank you. So we are going to uh, adjourn. I know a number of folks have constituents coming uh, for Prevention Day. We're going to run up to human services. And what do we say, 1040? 10.45? Yeah, so, um, so we'll come back at, at 10.45.